Hello. Today we're talking with Carrie Sinanon. Carrie did her, uh, got her PhD in literature from Trinity, Dublin. Uh, her dissertation was on the writings of slave masters and slaves, and it is the subject of a book that's under consideration by North Carolina University Press, tentatively called Slave Masters in the Language of Self, Traders, Planters, and Colonial Agents, 1750 to 1834. She's currently visiting here at Yale at the British Art Center as part of their Visiting Scholars program, and then will be returning to Galway, where she is a research fellow at the Moore Institute at the National University of Ireland. Carrie, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, l let's begin by, you're, you're someone who has a, a background in literature, and mm. you're, doing, uh, you're at the British Arts Center, mm. are doing some really interesting interdisciplinary work on, on slavery and the relationship between uh, uh, not only masters and slaves, but also representations of that. Could you say a little about the, the work that you've been doing and that's brought you here to Yale? Yes, well, the, the book on slave masters um, is almost finished. And in researching for it, a lot of material came up about slave women and slave women as mothers. And so that gave rise to this new project, which I received the funding for from the Visiting Scholarship um, Programme. And I'm really looking in a multidisciplinary way at representations of slave women as mothers. Um, it's a very hidden history. Right. The archives are not very yielding. These were hidden histories that weren't necessarily recorded. And so a multidisciplinary approach, looking at literature, looking at the historical archive, but also looking at the visual arts, can really offer us some insights into understanding more deeply the kind of forces within which slave women were constructed, represented, and even consumed by slavery. And are you uh, focusing on, on the British uh, Caribbean? Mm. Uh, uh, so Jamaica, you're... Uh, That's that right. And uh, and I assume you were here before uh, with with a Beinecke fellow and that's uh, right. Uh, and and is this related to the work that you're doing there as well? Well, indeed, I was looking at the archive of Thomas Thistlewood, a famous archive of a Jamaican overseer who kept. Um, almost 10,000 pages worth of diaries over decades. Um, within that archive, Thistlewood tells us very uh, empirical details about the slave plantation. And he doesn't tell us much about the lives of slaves, but throughout you can see traces of what the women's lives must have been like. In particular, he's quite infamous, um, Douglas Hall and Trevor Bernard. Right. The, the historians have talked about his almost daily routine sexual exploitation of women. Right. And so when I was looking at that archive, I also popped over to the Yale Centre for British Art and started to look at the images um, that represented the slave woman's body as both a sexualized object, right. but also as the site of um, the reproduction of, form of more slaves. So the meanings, the demands, the, the, the um, significances of the slave woman's bodies are, are, are caught between a myriad of forces within the slave plantation system. And I really wanted to come back and have a look in more detail. Well, that I mean, this is a fascinating subject because you say there are all these uh, different ways of looking at these enslaved women mm. uh, that somehow have to be reconciled. But I, th mm. uh, I, I think in some ways, those kind of ways of thinking about uh, 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 women in general are you know with us today. Mm -hmm. uh, so could we begin maybe mm. by by looking at uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the first. Uh, uh, images in in the collection that you uh, yeah there's a story to tell I think if we begin with this um, rather infamous and well known image of the sable Venus um, from Angola to the West Indies it's a, it's a really an ironic uh, imitation of Botticelli's. Venus. Right, exactly. And that strikes us immediately. And of course, uh, these kinds of planter um, histories and the, these kinds of writings, travel writings written by and for the plantocracy were very powerful um, pieces of writing in perpetuating ideologies that, that continue to support slavery. And here we have really a, a sort of slave master's fantasy. Um, and what strikes us immediately is 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 the colour, is race. This is not Botticelli's Venus. This is a black woman who is being harnessed. But we can, if we look closely, the the harnessing is is 
also her slave chains and she's right. wearing a slave collar and so she's not steering her uh, shell chariot at all she's being she's forcibly being brought driven, yeah, yeah. and the contrast between her and the white cherubs around her is really quite um, heartbreaking in so many ways um, but she's also sexualized here. She's not allowed the sort of um, the hair or the hands that would cover her modesty in the way that the Venus de Medici statues right. allow. And she's really been forcibly denuded um, by the gaze of of the 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 viewer. And she's being harnessed for f- her sexual right um, favors. She's being harnessed for her labor as a slave she's being harnessed for her reproductivity as well and so all these competing forces I think can be seen in this image now um, was the artist uh, so this um, who is the artist uh, of here this? is a, the engraver Thomas Stottard and uh-huh. he, he would have been um, he drew this he made this engraving for the the history uh-huh. of Brian Edwards who was a very powerful uh, planter right yeah and it, so I guess I mean the questions I have is that is it who's the intended audience mm. and what is the intention of I mean what mm. is this image meant to elicit is are there mm. ways that you can pull or that you can kind of venture to kind of discuss that well this is what's so this is why I think a multidisciplinary approach is so necessary because th- th- that's exactly I'm not sure we could ever fully recover what the intended audience would have seen because it's so hard for us to dissociate right. our our lens. However, I, th- I think it's very clear that it is it is a, a an ironic fantasy, but that's also got realism in there. She uh-huh. is a valuable unit. <laughs> right. Um, she is a sexualized object, so she's definitely being exhibited. I think in this way, um, but she's also being exhibited as as I say as um really quite pr- productive. Uh huh. I mean, she's surrounded by, as you said, this uh, like kind of uh, images of of the Greek, you know, New Greek gods and yes. this neoclassical thing. And that, that's I wonder, is this uh, meant then to be humorous that uh, the kind of irony of, of, of say, of calling, uh, you know, an enslaved person Caesar or Pompey or something mm, exactly. in that way mm-hmm. as, a, as as some kind of mm-hmm. terrible joke uh, or um I mean, I yes. assume. I mean, to us, it's it's disconcerting. You know, uh, to me at least, it seems very disconcerting to see uh, this contrast because I can't help but think about a whole range of the way that uh, that that Europe and the America and the Af- Africa has been, you know, uh, uh, depicted uh, in the bodies of of women yes. uh, as well, and uh, so it's kind of disconcerting. Mm. Now, is there a way that you can take the uh, uh, the work of Brian Edwards himself, and 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 mm. match up in some way mm. with the uh, with the representation of the woman in the image. Yeah, I mean this this is this is the thing. I mean she's being Tim Barringer writes about this image in his in a book on art and emancipation in Jamaica, and he says she's being served up. And I think that's a right. really uh, good way of putting it. And, and and yes, you're right. There is a horrible irony. There's a there's a joke being played here, which is deeply, deeply disturbing, but would not have been disturbing to the audience, the plantocracy audience. Don't forget, so many of the um, West Indian planters were not resident there. Right. And um, they're being they're wanting to be told by their uh, colleague, Brian Edwards, that all is well, that the that the that their plantations are indeed thriving and pro- prosperous. Um, and really this history, as it was then, is, is really an account of of the the, de- the 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 dependency now the need the economic argument for maintaining slavery in the colonies of you know this is definitely an absolute right that right. the British Empire have to um, extracting everything they can from their colonies and this woman she's a metonymy in a way she represents right right all slave women she she will be the tool they use to get so many things to to harness so many desires that are at play within the slavery system. Right, and even to the point of, uh, in some ways, representing the Middle Passage itself. Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, in this image. It's a deeply disturbing re-articulation of that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, people may know that one of the earliest accounts we have of um, the slave woman as a mother is in Richard Lee Gaughan's History of Barbados um, from 1657. Uh-huh. And he talks about 
Um, this is again a, a true and exact history of the island of Barbados, which is telling his English audience uh, uh, about really everything that's going on in Barbados and how the planters run their plantations and uh, an account of the peoples there. And he, he is uh, an apologist for slavery. But within that story, he has a small extract about um, a Native American woman who has helped him right. he's, he's had worms in his feet and her name is, is Yariko and he says that she was um, brought here by um, a, an English slave captain who she rescued huh. and he then sold her into slavery so that's from 1657 that story, that idea of the slave woman as both the object of desire and as the producer of more slaves is really in these kind of histories from the very, very beginning. And then if we turn to the historical record, um, this, this came up when I was looking at the slave master's records. Sure. Um, I came across some interesting extracts from John Newton, a famous English slave captain right. who then became a right. very famous abolitionist, right. of the course. Author of Amazing Grace. Indeed, yes. indeed. And he's more well known now in his journal of a slave dealer. He has several um, extracts about rejecting slave women for what he calls being fallen breasted. And I didn't know what to do with these extracts because he takes on older women. Right. He takes on pregnant women. He takes women with small children. He rejects slaves who he says are poorly made and sometimes he says they have a bad mouth and he sent them back so I'm not sure sh- you know it's hard to know exactly what that meant right. but this repetition of women having long breasts and therefore not being purchasable in his opinion is a repeated thing throughout his journals and so one can speculate with right. this kind of historical record as to what uh, criteria were in operation even at the moment of purchasing slave women, if we think of how how sort of desirable this sable Venus is made to look, um, it's arguable that, that, that women who did not conform to certain ideals of beauty were rejected right. by right. slave traders at the very coast. But so is, this is, so is he looking at this long breastedness as being, uh, but a, a sign of someone who's, 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 Who's older and has been a, been a nurse for many years, or is it, or is it more, or is it simply just uh, uh, visually unappealing and and not uh, kind of his like conception of what uh, an mm. enslaved woman should should uh, look like? It's it's really really hard to know. I can he takes on several old women. He uh-huh. says calls them old women, and his diaries, his journals on the slave coast really talk about how hard it is to get hold of slaves. You know, it's right. not easy to fill up that ship with several hundred slaves. And within that competitive environment, he still repeatedly rejects women, and they are often women with babies. But right. um, they won't have. They won't be that old. Right. He'll reject women with, with long breasts, and that, you know, this is why a multidisciplinary is a, approach is needed because I can only take that evidence and put it alongside other pieces of evidence sure. and try and build up a picture of this history, of what forces were at work. And I, I'm arguing, I think, that yes, ideals of beauty of when when these women were going to emerge on the other side of the um, Mid Atlantic Passage right. and be viewed as they were by their prospective buyers. Um, what criteria were in operation? Well, and also, are, is he looking for at, at these women as being um, like sexual possible concubines? You know, con- possible. you know that this is what's so very, very disturbing. Right. You know whether that 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 you know it must have been part of what was understood right. to be, as I say, their their multifarious uh, uh, functions, the slave women. Because as I understand it, uh, the 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 slave trade to uh, Barbados and, and Jamaica is predominantly men. They're mm. looking for mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. Uh, for men who will be laboring in in the sugar cane fields mm-hmm. and and uh, and I don't know that mm-hmm. they're that they're. Uh, I, I, are you do you do you have a kind of statistical? I don't. I, I, how I many? Don't, I don't have statistics on the proportion, but you're absolutely right that the highest prices go for. Right. for a man but they will fill their ships right down to children sure. and and old women because as the colonies I mean jo- John Newton's writing in the 1750s by which point the plantations are fully up and running right. and 
unlike at the beginning in, in Barbados where you'd need the hard labour to get the, you know, in the 1650s to mm-hmm. get the island right. productive. Now you've got the colonists there. You've uh-huh. got what would have been called the Creoles who are resident there yeah. and they have their rather lavish domestic households to run and so the, the many roles for many more different kinds of slaves proliferate. Uh-huh. And so there, there will be an understanding that you need um, more than just men to right. dig the fields. <laughs> Right, and I assume they're also saying that that as there is pushback against the um, um, transatlantic slave trade, mm. the need to be able to reproduce your, exactly uh, rather right. than replace uh, mm-hmm. uh, your uh, your working population mm-hmm. uh, is is changing as well. Well, and that's really true. And I mean, Michael Cratton is one of the slave historians who has um, done a lot of work on the rates of infanticide, for example, on the plantations, women hmm. um, of, of, of um, self-performed abortions by slave women who would rather do that unspeakable act than allow their children to be born into slavery. Right. And so um, he, he calls their conditions similar to those of the Nazi concentration camps. And hmm. yes, reproduction rates were very, very low. So that was a source of anxiety. Right, right. Um, what really struck me here at the YCBA and looking at the images um, to accompany a lot of these um, pro-slavery accounts of the West Indies, what struck me was the, predo- the p- predominance of this image of the slave mother yeah. and her children as something else entirely, as almost a romanticised sign of a rural idyll. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. and the hic- is it Hickwell? Hickwell, yeah. Uh, this looks like out of a kind of pastoral tradition that you could easily kind of imagine this is in in the England uh, English countryside, Indeed. or uh, uh, except that it isn't. Uh, exactly. Uh, so say say a little more about what's happening. Yeah. In, so in so really, what I wanted to come back to the YCBA to do was to hunt for some images to see sure. what was there, and I think this if we look at this image, it's just very typical of many of the images that accompany these kind of uh, picturesque accounts of the of the islands. And this one is a picturesque tour of the island of Jamaica. And of course, Hickwell was trained as an architect, but he was um, undertaking um, landscape drawings. Right. He came over to Jamaica from 1820 to 1821 and did a series of plates to accompany this tour. And as you're absolutely right in saying it, his, his readers will, will be familiar with this as uh, reminiscent of the of the English picturesque the, right. the tradition, yeah. um, and it seems as if the mother here and her two children are almost a, a, a an underlining that all is well, all is peaceful, all is calm. Right. Slavery is almost erased, except as you say, it can never be because this is a slave colony. Mm. Yes, and this it, is a slave yeah. mother with her children. But it looks very much like the sort of travel uh, paintings as say this could be uh, were it not for the individuals uh, in Italy or exactly. someplace like exactly. that and to the uh, in in the some ways to the viewer appealing to the kind of interest in this exotic uh, idyllic place Absolutely. without kind of weighing uh, the human suffering yeah and it's, t- it's tapping into that romantic uh, tradition um, that the there is ease within a laboring, class um, right, right. we can we can see it repeated this image repeated in his um, bridge over the White River now if we look closely at the figures at the bottom left this is a washerwoman uh-huh. um, that would have been a very hard job and often washerwomen are depicted with their children um, as if this is something one can do at ease mm-hmm. again the rural little is, is undisturbed. Yeah. It goes right back, as you say, to the pastoral tradition. And we can put it um, actually in the tradition of maybe this image called The Harvest. Yes, okay. By this. by James Herring. Right. Um, so if we look here, this is the kind of imagery that Hickwell is, is drawing on. Here we have a, an estate in yes. England. James Herring is actually the painter and the owner of this estate. Hmm. And he has depicted himself in the background there riding through his horse, ah, on his horse okay. through the cornfield or wheat field. And he is sending a message to himself and to everybody around him that 
I run a good a good estate. Right. My workers have time to, if we look at the close up, right. Um, my my labouring women have time to nurse their infants right. at their ease, and there's a perfect balance between labour and production and humanity right. <laughs> on my estate. And that seems to be the kind of tradition. He's that, a good master. Yes, he's a good master. Yeah, exactly. He's providing for his and they're mm. and they're happy and content. Mm. And this is kind of a time of celebration mm-hmm. and all the kind of things that go in. And the nursing mother is sort yeah. of the underlining of that because this is the most tender relationship you can have. Right. And if this relationship can exist here, then we know all as well. Yes, because there's it. There's continuity that's kind of built into the this image. Yeah, uh, continuity going back to Madonna and right, Child. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So the the images that we've looked at so far depict a uh, a landscape that is kind of pleasurable. It's a place where people are at their leisure and that sort of thing. But it's not the kind of landscape image that springs to mind when I think about the real work of a plantation in Jamaica. And, mm. and could you say more about, mm. you know, that? And and, mm. and w- is this an imaginary spot or is this a mm. Jamaican scene? These are these are real spots, but of course it's in the depiction of them that that that's that's we encounter so many interesting questions just like this. These are these are real spots, but they are very much being painted in a tradition of uh, the picturesque landscape. And they we can have other examples. Um, William Beckford was another very powerful Jamaican planter and he commissioned this series of prints um, by George Robertson and they were the paintings and they were turned into prints. And here we have um, a view in the island of Jamaica. Um, It's much more exotic and a bit more wild, but again, it's drawing on the Gainsborough tradition. Right. Yes, you can. Exactly. There's the, the... Central figures and uh, and there's the livestock and it's yes. kind of in this uh, as if they're naturally there as if right. nobody engineered yeah, this, this landscape this peaceable kingdom mm. that they're all part mm. of uh, right and with uh, uh, and with the uh, the the woman again the enslaved woman in the center of, yes of the lower center of the uh, image yes uh. as, as if one appears to be um, possibly a mulatto woman uh-huh. and again the mulatto woman was almost uh, another interesting figure that we'll come to talk about a bit more but she seems to be at her leisure to buy goods from another uh, slave who's huckstering uh-huh. and this is really a sign again you'll see this repeated image of of slaves being able to um, almost be richer than the peasants back in England that's another message uh-huh. these these images want to send that this is um, a productive look how productive and exotic all of this land is um, look how easily it lends itself to yielding produce and look at how easy it is for people to to extract that produce you are not going to see the kind of plantations that we might see in something like 12 years a slave right right uh yeah there's no uh there's no violence in no. in any of these uh images that's no. for certain okay we we go now to Augustino Brunias. Uh, could you say something about about this work? Well, he's one of the most fascinating artists. Um, very, very prolific. He was born an Italian, but he soon came to England um, and with Robert Adam, who was on a grand tour. And he was given many commissions in England to paint um, stately homes. And then he hooked up with Sir William Young, who was the governor of Dominica. And in 1770, he travelled with Sir William Young to Dominica. And it was almost as if he was commissioned to paint um, marketing. Right. These were going to be exhibited back home. Come here. Look at this wonderful, lovely island, and certainly the sexuality of the slave women is as a part of that. Um, now, there are many different ways of, of looking at this kind of image, which is called a linen market, huh. with a linen stall and a vegetable seller in the West Indies. And commentators who talk about Brunias's work really talk about the the um, commodity culture he's depicting here. Absolutely, yeah. And as you say, um, it's uh, nobody's suffering here. Right. We have a group of Carib Indians on the left coming to market with their produce. We have um, what um, Brunias is constructing as the sort of very comely and desirable mulatto woman. Uh-huh. She's possibly free at this point. She's buying uh, linen from uh, the slave women. And so we have a, a little economy all sitting here and he's definitely drawing on an ethnographic tradition 
yeah, um, absolutely. that we we might feel very uneasy with today. But what really struck me about this image, um, if we go to a close up of the bottom right hand corner, she's not very visible initially. But what struck me was this image of a, a slave mother with her baby nursing. Um, and so the slave mother is there. Right, right. Uh, within this scene. And she's nursing very comfortably and happily. And this is definitely an, is an, an ideal. Right. And again, if this is marketing in a form, this is uh, a part of it too, is that this, you know, is... Uh, a healthy baby mm, uh, yes uh, 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 and just uh, kind of depicts the overall abundance of this island and in fact if you look at the the entire painting mm. it's not too different it seems to me from the way that the Caribbean is continues to be marketed as this kind Indeed. of exotic uh, place that's familiar yet is not familiar exactly and I mean that this is the thing people would have known be, be, people would have been very familiar at this point with the works of painters like Canaletto and the high key Italianate, sure. and so these 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 colours, as you say, ex- registering the exotic, but also it's not too unfamiliar. It's 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 familiar and a little bit different at the same time. So there's this enticement, and and femininity is playing a huge part uh, uh, in this image, mm. uh, and this is one of many. Yeah, absolutely. There, yeah, the the uh, the few men that are in this uh, this uh, painting are kind of uh, periphery. They're not. Uh, mm. They're they're not the focus. The light is not mm-hmm. shining on on them. It's, if we um, want to get to the more disturbing aspect of it, of course, it is a male viewer who is being uh, intended mm, as right. and that, and so and of course within this market. Every woman there is a kind of commodity, whether she's a slave or or a free mulatto. Right. And what's even more disturbing then, if we return to the touching image of the slave mother nursing her baby, is that that they are both commodities too. And within the slave system, that that connection is not going to continue. Right. That slave is not. Right. That does not belong to its mother. Yeah. That baby belongs to its master and is a chattel, to be traded and sold at at will. And so that's the disturbing truth. The slave mother in this image, I, I would suggest, really uh, disturbs any sense that all is well. Which I guess um, makes me wonder, and, and this I, I know you, you get to, is what is, uh, what is both... I mean, there seems to be work going on in, in these paintings to... Uh, to present the uh, slave system in the most desirable light, but it the images themselves uh, undercut exactly. uh, that that as well. Could you mm. uh, say more about that? Is that yeah uh, well this this I think you've really you've really put your finger on it. Um, you know, you can't pre- present an image of a mother slave feeding her child as if it is the Madonna and child right. without immediately realizing that of course it isn't. Right. And and that's I don't think that's just our uh, lens from our contemporary perspective. The viewer of this painting back in England or in Dominica would know <laughs> that these are people whose lives are to be bought and sold. And so there is this um, uneasy, unresolvable um, tension within the paintings by Brunias, and he, 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 you know, he's often read as somebody who reproduces the racialized ideology of the planter right. class. But at the same time, these are individuals who disturb that they can't stay in their static positions. They are, they are also real human beings. Right, right. The. The terms of their of their uh, existence can't help but c- kind of come through. Uh, yeah. Uh, in that, although it actually though does I mean are there are of course um, abolitionist minded mm. painters who mm. are also depicting mm. uh, the Jamaican scene and, and the mm. British West Indies. Can you? Uh, well, uh, are you working with those? As yeah. Well? well, that was what brought me to to this was was the really rather famous plates by William Blake of, oh, yeah, of John Steadman's of narrative right. um, of his five years expedition to Suriname and uh, jo- John John Steadman was himself very conflicted. He, he wrote what really is an abolitionist piece mm-hmm. while claiming himself to think that we still need slavery. Right. The images that 
that Blake produced, the prints that Blake produced based on Stedman's drawings are powerful um, indictments on what slaves had to put up with, but especially what the body of the slave women had to endure. Again, critics are very uneasy with some of these images which show slave women being lacerated and whipped naked, um, slave men being... um, battered uh, on on crosses and um, the slave body is shown to endure unspeakable horrors um and um this whether whether Stedman wanted these images to to lead to, to outright emancipation or not he he didn't have a say that people read these images as powerful abolitionist arguments and, eman- and arguments for anti- uh, the abolition of slavery altogether. Right, and I would imagine that people looking at some of these other more pastoral images mm. are looking at that knowing the images mm. of Blake, uh, yes. that they're kind of have set uh, yeah. a- another way of reading into yeah. the images of, of, say, Jamaica. Or... Well, this is what's so interesting. I mean, what's really interesting, and, you know, I more work needs to be done on this but what's really interesting is the very tight timeline I think of abolition that it really isn't until 1780 (laughs) that everybody wakes up and starts to say this and that's not to say there haven't been voices before that but as with every um, um, sort of awareness that we have today we might think of our own awareness of environmental issues there's a history to that concern similarly there's a history to when people start to sit up and say um, we can't be putting people into ships. I mean, that when they, when Thomas Clarkson released that image of the Brook ship with the famous image of the people packed like barrels. Right. That was an enormous conscious raise, consciousness right. raiser. Right. Um, so, yes, you're absolutely right. People and, and people will have been reading abolitionist poetry, abolitionist material. Um, but almost the more the abolitionists argue, the more the planters argue back. And so you get the two strands of the discourse. Huh. Well, as you say, uh, the even though there is this history, of course, to thinking about uh, uh, slavery, the slave trade, and abolition uh, by the uh, late 18th century, it is it has become the kind of question of the day. Yeah. And I think this is uh, certainly in this next image is is very uh, very uh, evident. Yeah, it's an enormous contrast with what we've seen before. Again, similar ideas at work, but for a totally different purpose. John Smith was an engraver, um, highly, highly regarded, one of the best mezzo tinters around. And George Moreland was um, a, a very good painter. He could have been brilliant, but he was crippled by almost chronic alcoholism mm. and John Barrell talks about him in his in, in his book um, as somebody who's maybe been uh, underrated but these two prints came out in 1790 John Smith seems to have suggested to Moreland that they take this opportunity as anti-slavery sentiment is, is on the rise and they produced these really quite expensive prints um, and this one here is called The Slave Trade yes. and we can see uh, that a slave family is at its heart and a slave mother with her infant who seems to be reaching up to to nurse. Um, right. she's, she's almost automatically breastfeeding him as two different slave captains are separating her husband or her partner and herself. Um, and she's being dragged into one boat and her husband, partner. Right. Th- this is how the p- image is presenting it. The family is being dragged into another boat and he's about to be um, beaten right, by his right. new owner. Um, so it's it's a deliberately um, affecting scene. It's again you'll notice some of the romantic ideas of the sublime and the romantic landscape. But this is back right. to the coast of Africa that that Moreland and Smith are taking us. Um, the people in the boat have their faces covered, and that's reminiscent of the pose of the expulsion from Eden. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's the dark uh, clouds uh, exactly. on the horizon. Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, and and as well as the the darkness of in the lower uh, left hand corner of I guess the ocean. That, yes. That kind of awaits them. And if we look, this man on the on the bottom right hand corner, yeah. it's maybe not as easy to see, but he's casting a very lascivious look at the huh. slave woman. And so we can see signalled in, in what is a sentimental picture, but I also think there's a lot of satire in operation. We can see already that this slave woman 
who is mother, wife, mm -hmm. uh, slave, also sexual object. We can right. already see all the many, many forces, not to mention those with, that will consume her child as well. Right. right. So it's, it's d designed to affect people very powerfully. And uh, it goes along with this other image uh, called African Hospitality, which also features um, a mother, two mothers, a white mother and a black mother. Um, this imagines what happens to these travellers who've been shipwrecked, again, on an imaginary coast. Yes. And we see a very strong African mother with her two healthy, strong babies supporting and helping an almost infantilised white mother. So there's right. a satire there too. And this is a representation of of Africans as entirely um, humane, intelligent, right. full of sentiment, appropriate right. to the time, right. ready to help others. And in return, they are bartered as slaves. Right. And are these are companion pieces. Yes, the, yes. Uh, the two, uh, they're both from 1790. Yes, and uh, we can focus in on the mothers, um, the image oh, right, of the slave mother, really trying to nurse her child, who's who's just unaware, really, of what's happening. Um, it's a very tragic, tragic scene. I think it's, it's, a, it's quite a moment of realism in the midst of this sentimental picture. And then if we contrast that with the depiction of um, the slave mo mother, well, the African mother here, right. with the English mother who isn't even really able to look at her child who's looking for attention. She's too weakened. So there's there's a depiction here, a deliberate satire on the English family right. as opposed to the, um, the African family. So that's the discourse working in, in the other direction. Are these, pre these um, paintings, were they presented um, just as these illustrations that you might frame and, and, and hang in your house? Or is there like a story behind them or some are they part of a, a, a larger narrative that well the, the, these are be, these were deliberately produced by Smith and Moreland and they were going to be sold for a guinea a piece so mm -hmm. these were quite high end objects and the idea they were these were prints that were made that were going to be um, desirable objects for prominent and genteel anti-slavery activists in in the um, cities. Right. Um, and so it would have been a way you you would position them somewhere in your household right. as a way of announcing your, your intentions. Sentiment, yeah. Yes, your sentiment and announcing your, your... Apparently they didn't sell as well as, as they'd wanted. And my feeling about that is that they're just too harsh. Right. They're quite, they're quite striking right. critiques. Yeah. Even if you're an abolitionist, the depiction of the English family as being treacherous. Yeah. Um, being saved on the one hand, but ready to buy and sell on the other. It's quite a lot to take. It's much easier to just not have sugar in your tea, right? And exactly. to put these images up on your wall. Yeah, I can, I can certainly understand. Uh, it is interesting, though, it, that it's um, in some ways the the crisis is set here on the coast of Africa. Indeed, uh, indeed. The, you know the you know, and it's the slave trade itself that is kind of uh, mm -hmm. under indictment, and less so. Uh, the plantation system. Uh. Indeed, and and this is it. That uh, you know, come um, the seventeen nineties, they 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 put everything into trying to abolish the slave right. trade. Right. So one step at a time. And what's also very fascinating about these um, Smith Morland prints is that these scenes um, and scenes like them are repeated in abolitionist poetry. So I'll just quickly read yes, out absolutely. some lines from Hannah Moore, a poem that she. Um, Eaglesfield Smith and Hannah Moore uh, co-authored um, Whitey man he came from far sailing o'er the briny flood who with help of British tar buys up human flesh and blood with the baby at my breast other two were sleeping by in my hut I sat at rest with no thought of danger nigh and so it's again the the slave mother in this sense can function as a powerful abolitionist tool Right. Because what can be more affecting than the idea of taking away a feeding baby from its mother? Right, and this, of course, is the, in in U.S. abolitionist uh, literature. This is the the one image that is is kind of presented to uh, to uh, get a, a a northern white audience to mm. empathize with that by mm. by talking about the family and yes. being kind of under attack. Uh, so yes. how do you how does with your work 
what do you kind of is this are you bound by this kind of moment of of the struggle over the uh, the end of the slave trade or mm. do you do you kind of uh, bring things up to the mm. 1830s mm. and the eventual abolition of how do you kind of how do you periodize? The, yeah, the I, th- I think I think we've our, our timeline in this conversation has has moved a little bit back and forth because we've ended on the high point of abolition, right. or what will become the high point of abolition, yeah. and won't succeed, of course, until the eighteen o three. Right. Um, um. But the the kind of works we were talking about earlier, the oh. the planters um, perspectives, yeah. uh, keep going. And um, Matthew Lewis travels to his Jamaican plantations in eighteen seventeen, and his right. his his journal. Of a West India proprietor is published just after emancipation to show him as a good master. Hmm. And so we have this discourse um, carrying on, uh, as you say, and, and then into the um, the sort of post abolitionist period of, you know, what will we do with with our with our well, newly these, free yes. uh, members of the British uh, yeah. Empire. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So uh, yes, I think it will. I, it would be normal. It would be right to go up and have a good look right up to the point of emancipation, maybe a little bit beyond. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I'm really being led by the material to see what the story there is to right. tell. Well, I think this is all very exciting and interesting work. I'm uh, so glad that we had a chance to Thank meet you, you in, in in what seems like the the final week that you. Uh, uh, have been here at Yale. I don't know why we don't find out <laughs> about people uh, sooner, but it's been a great pleasure talking to you. And thank you. The best of luck with well, your your new your new job and thank uh, you and and all your uh, fine research. And thank you and thank you to the Gilder Learman Center for your time and thanks to the YCBA and everybody there. Absolutely, I've received a lot of support. Yes, thanks. good friends of ours. Thanks. Thanks so much, Carrie. Okay. Bye.